<laughs> Madam Secretary, thank you so very much for being here. Um, the Secretary doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll give you just a brief one, uh, which is that she became the first woman uh, in the 232-year history of the U.S. Department of Treasury to hold that position. Uh, she began that job on January 26, 2021. And what, <laughs> how time has uh, probably flown or maybe it not has. flown. It um, has. It's been quite a week for you. You've been talking a lot. And so we, we brought you some water just in case you need some no, extra. I, I need it. Thank you. Um, this won't be a hearing, but I do want to spend some time thinking about where we are in this economy, what's happened, maybe some of the lessons learned, and sure. where we can go from here. Absolutely. And I'll tell you where I want to start. Okay. If you'd indulge me. You've been asked a hundred times, was it a mistake to call inflation transitory? Was, it, it, was that a mistake? And you've said yes. So we're not going to go down that road. What I want to know is now that we know what we know. If you could go back in time and do it differently, if there was a lesson learned, what was it? Um, so I wouldn't do it differently. I um, was very supportive of the American Rescue Plan. I recognized that there are all kinds of risks that the United States faced when President Biden took office. And um, things can always uh, happen that you don't expect. The world's very uncertain. And my assessment was that the biggest risk the United States faced is unemployment was very high, and most forecasters envisioned that it would stay that way for a very long time. And I worried about a generation of workers, families, households, that would really be scarred by that experience. And particularly when you think about the fact that it, the pandemic was right. so unfair and that the people who were hit the hardest, the very hardest, worse than, I mean, in almost every downturn of the economy, it's the less skilled people and typically minorities who were hardest hit. But this crisis was even worse in that dimension. And people were in danger of losing the roofs over their heads and the food on their also tables. Must, there must be a lesson in this. And I said, look, uh, you were not alone in considering this a transitory situation. The Federal Reserve also thought it was transitory. And so I just wonder, Larry Summers has come out, as you know, and said, maybe we need to rethink the models. Maybe we need to rethink how we think about this stuff. So, you know, I, I guess at the time, the way I would have thought about it was, if the package was very large and stimulated demand a lot, that it might drive unemployment to very low levels and wage and price inflation might pick up some. But I think what history had taught us was that the responsiveness of inflation to tightness in the labor market is not very large. Pe the way people um, in the business said it was, the Phillips curve, which relates inflation to right. unemployment, had become very flat. But I, I think what happened was that there were um, structural shocks that were caused by the pandemic. People switched their spending away from services toward goods. Bottlenecks were, you know, the ability of this right. good sector of our economy to ramp up production is limited, and when you think about economy's potential output, well, you can't immediately move people and resources out of services and into um, manufacturing. And bottlenecks began to be um, encountered. And the pandemic itself caused, you know, huge demand for semiconductors. And suddenly we're in a situation where something who could have expected that auto manufacturers aren't able to get enough semiconductors to produce their normal level of cars. They actually have had to right. cut back auto production. These were all special pandemic-related factors. What do you think of the idea that this is a heck of a, a problem to message to the American public? I, I In the sense that there's a, a, it's very hard to say there's not a lot of options. Well. You know, I think what most Americans, so let me see, it, inflation 
is clearly a major problem. It is President Biden's top priority. It's what I'm most focused on. And it's what American households are most concerned about. Because um, when you look at opinion polls and you see what households have to say, it, it's amazing how pessimistic they are, given that we have about the strongest labor market we've had in the entire post-war period. Um, people can easily find jobs. They're confident about the job market. Um, but that they, argument's not winning the day. It's not winning the day, I agree, because what they see is, and I think today national gas prices just hit. It's a billboard. Um, five, it's a billboard at every corner. Five dollars. And, you know, this has always been true that, um, I mean, if you look at surveys, for example, the Michigan survey of um, consumer expectations, inflation expectations are driven by gas prices, at least at the household level. That is what people see, and that's how they, they think about inflation. And, um, you know, look, there, I mean, it's true that gas prices started rising um, prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Part of it is that they fell when the pandemic right. came along, and then they started reverting to more normal levels. And so they did start increasing. That was a rebound toward normal. Um, oil producers had been pretty badly burned when oil prices fell. A lot of them suffered losses or went out of business, and oil production fell. And then along comes Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and now gas prices have escalated. And the truth is, President Biden has done, I think, what he can do about that. And that is that he agreed to an historically large release for six months of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is holding down oil prices below where they would otherwise be. But it's unlikely that oil, the gas prices are going to fall anytime soon. What do you think they're going to be? There's some analysts that think it could get to $6, $7. What do you think? Well, it really depends on what oil, I mean, oil price, gas prices track oil prices. Although the spread of gas prices to oil prices is also extremely high because refineries are running right. at full capacity. And, you know, it really, it really depends. We're, you know, Europe is trying very hard to free themselves from dependence on Russian oil. And our sanctions on Russia are making a difference. They're making a huge difference to food and energy prices. And, you know, our, I think our sanctions have been remarkably effective, but we continue to tighten them. And oil prices could go further. I want to go deep on energy and deep on sanctions in a moment. But I just okay. want to say that in terms of the, the general populace, so aware of inflation at this point, I wanted you to react to this. Do you know who Cardi B is? Sure. So Cardi B. I mean, I don't have that much time for it, but I, I, I mean, I am, alive, I am alive, you know. So Cardi B <laughs> tweets out over the weekend, when y'all going to announce there's a recession coming? And so I wanted you to react to what Cardi B is saying. Don't look to me to announce it. <laughs> I'm not going to announce it. I don't, I don't think we're going to have a recession. So, um, go ahead. Consumer spending is very strong. Investment spending is um, solid. Um, I expect growth to slow down. I mean, look, we had 5.5% growth last year. Why? We're um, operating well short of the economy's potential. Um, a year and a half ago, when President Biden assumed office, the unemployment rate was over 6%. Um, now we're at, I, I will say we're at full employment or beyond. Um, and so I absolutely expect growth to slow down. Uh, we love to see large job numbers in the White House, but don't expect or even want to con see um, monthly job gains that stay up at the 500,000 level. We want to transition to stable, strong growth. And not see further tightening at the labor, in the labor market given that we're right. at full employment. We, we have a very strong economy. I know people are very upset, and rightly so, about inflation, but there's nothing to suggest that inflation, in, that, that a recession's in the works. And 
as the Fed tightens monetary policy to contain demand and bring inflation down. I believe there is a path through this that entails a soft landing with the economy essentially stabilizing near full employment, maintain a strong labor market, uh, and not see a recession. From Cardi B to Jamie Dimon, though, because Jamie Dimon says that he sees a hurricane coming. He says it's sunny right now, but he thinks a hurricane is coming. He says that I, he doesn't know whether it's Superstorm Sandy or something else, uh, and maybe something less. But when, when you see somebody like that say something like that, do you call him up? Do you call him up and say, what, what are you seeing inside the bank? I have talked to him about what he sees inside the bank and other bankers, and I can tell you what they, what they see of their customers. Right. So um, his bank and other major banks track the average bank balances of their customers, and they have demographic information. And what they see are solid household finances. Now, this is a small thing, but um, the Federal Reserve started up a survey of household decision making. And they ask consumers regularly the question, um, if a $400 unexpected expense came along, could you come up with the money to cover it? And the highest, now, a shockingly large fraction of America cannot do that. But the smallest fraction ever of American households said that they could not cover a $400 expense. And at every level, from high-income consumers to low-income consumers, checking account balances are up significantly. I, I know that's not a full measure of wealth, but um, when I talk to Jamie and other major bankers who look at this data and look at the um, experience they have with debt, debt is, um, Debt service is certainly credit quality remains very strong. What they see are households in good shape. So that's not where, is there a recession risk? Of course there's recession risk. But is it likely? I don't right. think it's the most likely you're, thing. You're, you're an economist. So, what do you think the probability is? In any year, the unconditional probability of a recession is about 20%. So that's a significant risk, knowing absolutely. Do you think it's higher than that? So if I told you nothing about the economy at all, um, in any year, there's a 20% odds. Okay, so now we're in recession. our economy, and what's the house view? I'm sure you've done the math. My, my look, there are, there are clearly risks. Um, we have a, a very significant um, war that's affecting the global economy. Um, there are risks that food and energy prices can go higher. Um, as that's happened, the World Bank and IMF have been writing down their global forecasts. China faces risks from COVID and other right. developments. There is clearly a risk there. But is that, is that a mainline forecast? No, it's not my mainline forecast. And of course, the Fed's tightening monetary policy and that's, um, it's up to them right. to decide what to do, but it's an, it's an art. Right. And, um, you know, that could result in a recession, but um, we're a very strong economy and the fundamentals governing spending, uh, we have, uh, still have a large buffer stock of savings um, that can propel consumer right. demand. On energy. You made the point that there has been a lot of permitting and not a lot of drilling. Why do you think that is? Um, because until re recently in the pandemic, um, oil prices had been low. Oil firms suffered substantial losses, drilled too much, um, drove oil prices down to low levels, and firms have been cautious right. about wanting to But why aren't they doing it now then, you think? Well, I think they are beginning to do it now. And look, the, I, I think today Brent was around um, $123, right. if I'm not mistaken. And that is a huge market stimulus to doing it. What, what do you think of ESG it, as part of that conversation and whether that has led to less drilling, uh, a move away from fossil fuels? And, and I ask because as we try to balance this and figure out what the right answer is, 
There are arguably market forces at play here, but I'd also ask you how you feel about pension funds, public pension funds in America, by the way, some of who've decided to divest themselves of fossil fuels or to try to move away from fossil fuels. Is that the right answer when you think about the larger um, conversation that we're having now that also includes national security and the price of oil? So it's a, com I mean, it's a complicated issue. Um, I think climate change I regard as an existential threat. And um, I can think of few higher priorities in America than addressing climate change and doing so globally. And um, I, we need to be on a medium term path to accomplishing that. I regard that as very important. Um, so, and I think we should not back off that planet. It, right. There's a transition. The transition will be pretty long. Um, but should investment in fossil fuels diminish along that transition path? Well, of course they should. So it's not a foolish thing for companies to be thinking about. And that right. might mean that the supply response to higher prices is somewhat smaller than it might be without that. One of the things you talked about is this idea this week that in, in Europe there should effectively be a cartel effectively um, around uh, buyers of Russian oil to, to prevent the price from going too high. And I'm curious how you think you could do that because it effectively seemed to me that you'd have to effectively potentially sanction a China or an India if they didn't go along with the plan. Um, there would need to be a reasonably large group of countries that would go along with it, and it would be necessary to create such a coalition. But I would point out that um, the European Union has already announced th that they will phase out right. Russian oil purchases, but beyond that, they've said that they will also prohibit European countries from insuring tanker shipments out of Russia. And the UK is very likely to go along with such a ban. And that could have the effect of locking in a good deal of Russian oil. You've been very aggressive about sanctions around Russia. But I wonder how you think about China in this regard as what seems like an ally of Russia in this, in this war against Ukraine. And, and whether there is a, a role for the US to play and whether there's diplomatically a way to even do it. Um, well, I think it's fair to say we would be very unhappy if we saw China actively trying to help Russia get around our sanctions. And I don't see any significant evidence of that. It's clear that um, most Chinese banks, for example, really want to do business with the United States and with Europe. And are being quite careful to make sure that they abide by sanctions. So perhaps there are things, some things going on, but I don't see any substantial effort to um, help Russia get around sanctions. I think our sanctions have been very effective, would be my judgment. A couple more questions on, on, on the issue of inflation and, and what is leading to it. Uh, there have been points and moments where uh, the administration, the president, has made the argument that corporate greed is the reason for inflation. You seem to, to walk away from that a little bit, I thought, during the hearings this week. Um, look, you know, what I've said, I... It's I hard, see... I know, I know. <laughs> um, I see demand and supply is largely driving inflation. I, you know, I, I think... If you look at economic research, what, what you'd see is a trend over many decades toward diminished competition in many um, segments of the US economy, um, a, a reduction in competition. And so the administration is very focused on wanting to have a competitive economy um, a strong antitrust policy. And I, I agree with that. Right. And even in the labor market, I think we have seen the same thing. Um, you know, forcing 
workers and even low-income workers in many sectors of the economy to sign things like non-compete clauses that tend to hold their wages down. The Treasury just produced a, a paper on this topic. And so I do think it's appropriate to have a strong antitrust policy. But um, so pri price cost right. margins have gone up in many sectors, but I don't think that's what's driving inflation. What about immigration in the conversation around inflation? Do you think if there was a different immigration policy, it would change the outcome? So diminished labor supply is certainly part of the unexpected. You know, when we see labor market tightness, um, labor force participation, labor supply diminished because of the pandemic, expected in some sense the pandemic to end, to have an end rather than these um, constant new variants affecting, affecting the economy. And labor force participation hasn't fully rebounded and immigration has been very low. And Certainly, boosting labor supply would be a way to relieve some of the tightness. So, have you had a conversation with the, the president about immigration then? Well, some things have been done. Um, for example, you know, there's a shortage of workers in the agency that processes mm -hmm. um, work permits, you know, applications for work permits. And there have been some speeding up of that. Um, people who were waiting for, had been working in the United States, had to apply for renewals, um, were unable to work while these applications were hung up, and that's been, that's been changed. So that's a step they can continue to work, um, even though there are delays in processing their paperwork. So some steps right. have been taken, but I mean, immigration is a complicated issue with a, um, a lot of politics. Okay, I got another complicated one for you. So this is uh, Joe Biden on Twitter, no less. Uh, you want to bring down inflation, he writes. Uh, let's make the wealthiest corporations pay their fair share. This is about taxes. By the way, Jeff Bezos responded to this by saying the newly created disinformation board should review this tweet or maybe they need to form a new non sequitur board instead. Raising corporate taxes is fine to discuss. Taming inflation is critical to discuss. Mushing them together is just misdirection. So maybe there were a couple of miss missing steps in there. <laughs> let, let, me, um, let, let me try to fill them in. OK. Um, you can tweet back to Jeff. Okay. So let me, let me give it a shot. Um, so we look first and foremost to the Fed to deal with inflation. Um, but having a fiscal policy that is at least complementary and supportive is a step that we can take on the fiscal side to deal with inflation. And that points to deficit reduction. And how can we accomplish deficit reduction by, um, if we have some spending programs, um, ra or whatever, raising taxes by more than any right. spending increases. So, Taking steps to reduce deficits is a meaningful way to support the Fed's efforts in reducing inflation, and President Biden supports that. And um, what he wants to do, and I think this is right, and I'm very supportive of it, is to raise taxes by asking wealthy individuals and corporations to pay their fair share. And what we have seen over decades in the United States and around the world is um, a race to the bottom in corporate tax rates. We had very substantial cuts in corporate tax rates. Um, the sh corporate tax revenue as a share of GDP has fallen to exceptionally low levels. And we've negotiated an agreement internationally, that can internationally mm -hmm. with 137 countries in which we will hold hands and, and raise taxes together. And for, from the point of view of American firms, this is an agreement that actually improves their competitiveness. Now, it may ask them to pay more taxes, but competitiveness is how can I compete versus you? And other countries will raise taxes much more than the United States will. You've also proposed a billionaire's tax, and I want to ask you about that. A, because it doesn't, it's, it seems almost dead on arrival politically in terms of its ability to, to pass. But I'm curious why what I think a lot of people look at as low-hanging fruit, 
um, step-up basis upon death, for example. Maybe capital gains rates to the extent you want to deal with them. Carried interest, which has been on the list of, uh, by the way, President Trump and President Biden and every Democrat I know, and yet, for some reason, still exists in the tax code as it is. 1031 exchanges in the real estate world. I mean, there are some things that a lot of people think are very sort of like, those are the things. Well, we, we propose those things too. And so, but the question is why those have not uh, moved forward and why, I mean, the billionaire's tax is an interesting tax, but it's a complicated one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It, it's a suite of measures that include most of the things that you just listed. And I mean, there are abuses in the um, estate and gift tax area that um, Treasury uh, administration proposals address, carried interest, um, other things. You know, what we've proposed is that um, death become essentially a realization right. event, event, and not only would there be stepped up basis, but um, capital gains would be taxed, would be taxed at death. Right. I mean, the problem is that a large share of income takes the form of unrealized capital gains, and it it's often escapes taxation not only in life, but, but ever. Right. And this so-called billionaire's tax, it's a minimum tax that um, attempts to impose a 20% um, essentially income tax on all income, including unrealized gains, and the amount that pay, is paid then becomes sort of a prepayment of what right. would be due when they're realized. I, I have a messaging question for you. Um, and we might have some billionaires who've been targeted in this audience uh, around this issue. It's very frequent where politicians, including members of this administration, say, look at so-and-so, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, whoever, they're not paying their fair share, and they look, look at them as if, they're, as, look, as if they are illegally flouting the tax code. But it's and, and, I always, and I always wonder, it's perfectly legal, and I always wonder why the target is made of the person who's actually, for better or worse, following the law and not targeting Congress for creating the law in the first place. Well, we would certainly like to see Congress change some of the tax laws, and we've been working very hard to try to accomplish that. As you know, it's politically very difficult. We've not had a lot of bipartisan cooperation on it. Um, separately, one of those people I mentioned, Elon Musk, he recently came out, and we were talking about ESG earlier, and said that ESG, he thinks, is a scam. I don't know if you saw that. He represents, obviously, Tesla. And he said ESG is a scam because Tesla was removed from the S&P 500's uh, list of ESG companies, interestingly enough. Um, and I'm curious if you think ESG is, is a scam insofar as it's a, a free market or that there's something else going on? Well, I think there are a lot of companies that um, want to make a contribution to addressing climate change in particular and are making commitments. And I certainly wouldn't say there's anything that's a scam about that, but um, often it's very difficult for investors to have the information to know what concrete actions lie behind that. And so things can call themselves green, and it's we, there's insufficient information to be able right. to tell exactly what the basis for that claim is. Right. Um, you know, Europe is trying hard to establish standards um, to be able to use that label. It, it is an issue when um, the SEC has a proposal out for companies to um, provide much more information about their climate. A question that goes back to maybe the divesting question. There's a whole uh, world of folks who talk about debanking certain worlds, debanking fossil fuels, banks that may not want to be in business with fossil fuels, banks, and I know we're going to talk to Senator Murphy later, that may not want to be involved in the gun industry. And very interesting, what's happening right now in this country is that there are a number of places, especially various states, oftentimes uh, red states, um, think of the state of Texas, for example, that, and, and, and Florida, you can see what the governor DeSantis has is, is approached this issue, where companies that actually want to speak out on certain issues are not just worried about whether their customers are going to agree or not, but now worried that there's actually going to be financial retribution from politicians. What do you think about that? Well, it's a difficult thing for companies to contend with, but um, they have a whole variety of stakeholders 
that they need to be attentive to their interests. Um, so a couple of years ago, the Business Roundtable um, actually produced a sort of new definition right. of um, what the objectives of a corporation should be and that it should go beyond the interests of investors and owners, but also take account of workers, communities, um, broader, broader interests. And these companies are trying to, trying to do that. And I think that's the right thing. You know, they're obviously right. free to have their own opinions about how to pursue that. But I well, think What about the politicians right on the other it. side? Fair, unfair? Um, it's political. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's fair or unfair. I'm not sure. But it is something the companies have to contend with. Uh, we're going to run out of time, but I have a couple of quick questions. I've never been able to do an interview without talking about crypto recently. You and I always talk <laughs> about crypto. Um, Fidelity recently announced that they are going to allow customers to buy Bitcoin in their 401k plans. The Labor Department came out and said that that is a crazy idea and that employers should not allow that to happen. What does the Treasury Secretary have to say about that? Um, it's not something that I would recommend to most uh, people who were saving for their retirement. Um, to me, it's a very risky investment. Um, there, you know, the tax laws have created um, the opportunity to save in tax advantaged ways. And if Congress wanted to get involved in legislating in this area and say, um, we've given tax incentives for 401ks or retirement plans, and we want to regulate what form that savings can take, to my mind, that would be legitimate. I'm not saying right. I'm recommending it, but um, it, that, that, to my mind, would be a reasonable thing. Um, it's not something I would, I would recommend. You're not, you're not putting it in your retirement plan. Case. Um, final question. Why is it going to take till 2030 to get Harriet Tubman on, on, on the $20 bill? <laughs> I promise I will do everything to speed up the process. But as I learned when I was at the Federal Reserve, and I've, I've seen this both from the Fed side and the Treasury side, producing currency is a technologically very challenging project. And the main reason we introduce um, new versions of currency is not because we want new people on the bills, but because we're embodying in the currency a new generation of anti-counterfeit technology. And producing that and manufacturing that is also an extremely complicated process. And so our bills have become extremely sophisticated and um, the people responsible for producing currency want to wait until there is sufficient new technology, anti-counterfeiting, to start. So the tech is not ready yet. Bill. I think the tech's not ready. Okay, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, thank you so very, very much for thank joining you. us. Appreciate it thank very, very much. Thank you. After you. Thank you.